Well, we've got a few viewers, so let's just get started. Oh, shit. Yeah, I don't want this stream to last too long. So, we'll basically just go through it exercise by exercise. Some of them I won't have a lot to say about, so I'll just try and stretch that out as long as possible and talk about nothing. But if you guys have any questions that are related to this work, uh, Ariel will read them out and I will answer them to the best of my ability. So with this page, for the most part, it's actually done pretty perfectly in that it's not like without flaws, but what I'm really looking for is signs that she understands what she's meant to be aiming for with each stroke that she puts down. And so that means that these kinds of separations that we see here in the lines, the fraying on one end, that's completely normal. Uh, what I really look for is signs that when she drew the lines, that she uh, drew from... Hold on, is the video reversed? It doesn't matter. All right, whatever. I guess it's... Right so uh, I look for signs that when her pen touched the page and took off, that it maintained a consistent trajectory. When we're drawing, the line doesn't necessarily... Like, if we draw slowly... Our line might start uh, wobbling and waving, and that's what we want to avoid. That doesn't mean that we're just matching the line perfectly. That's the goal, but it's not really what I'm looking for. All right. So, as you can see here, it's all very smooth. And, and you know, to keep it short, that's essentially what I'm looking for. As the lines get longer, there is more separation here, but she's not constantly trying to come back to this line. Once you take a trajectory, you stick to it, and that's it. There is a little bit of arcing here uh, in these really long ones, because she is somewhat consciously trying to return to the line itself. But it's not, as long as it's not really wobbling, I'm okay with it. With these curved ones, you do tend to see more of a wobble here. You see how they're kind of coming in and out. And to be honest, everyone does it with these particular curves, and especially the waves, just because they're kind of inconsistent. If you remember from the mark-making rules of Lesson 1, I actually say that if you're going to end up with lines that get real wavy, um, generally, you want to construct them in parts. Like something like that. Just because you don't want your trajectory to continually turn back and forth. Now, in this case, it's just an exercise to kind of get control of your arm and to use your shoulder. And so it's not a big deal here. Oftentimes, where something might be an issue... Uh, in one place, we're not always concerned about it in everything that we do. So there's the two pages of this. Pretty well done. Next, the ghosted lines. Uh, I believe in the notes I talk about how I look for, there's like three different levels, where the first one, we're nudging it constantly. I know, I know. So the first, uh, let me see if I remember this correct. Actually, I have to look it up just to be accurate. Let's see. Should be page two. Yeah. So there's three levels here. The first level is the line is smooth and consistent without any visible wobbling, but doesn't quite pass through the, either of the two points uh, due to not following the right tra trajectory. It's a straight shot, but misses the mark a bit. Level two, the line is straight and smooth without any wobbling and maintains the correct trajectory. It does, however, fall short or overshoot both points. Level three, the line is straight, consistent, no wobbling. It hits both points and starts at one and stops at the other. So all three of these are valid. Even if you're just doing level one, uh, that's totally fine because these exercises are just meant to kind of understand your goals. And in this exercise, you've got three distinct goals. If you're still trying to meet goal number one, just focus on that. And so here, 
uh, for the most part. We've got this one is a little bit wobbly. It's pretty minimal, fairly straight. A lot of the longer ones are still quite straight. And I think she was probably working starting out here and then working her way down to here because we can see considerable improvement in just how straight these remain. And even in her accuracy, like a lot of these, this is getting pretty close to, you know, hitting both points perfectly and uh, not overshooting. I see a little bit of overshooting here, but not that big of a deal. Uh, towards this corner where she would have started, there's a lot less accuracy. She's missing those points a little bit. But, of course, she clearly understands what she's aiming for, and that's what I'm looking for. How dare you not watch all my videos doing this? I mean, I watch them in person. It's just, it's a lot to watch. I don't think anyone watches them. So there is the planes exercise, but because, actually, you know what? Let's critique the planes and then come back to them for the ellipses. Although there's not a lot to say because it's essentially an extension of the ghosted lines exercise. The only tricky part of it is that students, when they take a simple concept that's generally applied to a single line and they have to draw uh, those lines in relationship to other lines, they start to get distracted. The problem is still the same. You still have two points and you're drawing a line between it. But here you can see that there's corners that don't quite meet, uh, corners that are overshot. Um, you know, these are not quite meeting correctly. None of these. Yeah, and so... That's basically because the student gets a little bit uh, overwhelmed with just all the things that they need to balance in their heads. And as they kind of work through it all, they gradually get better at balancing the multiple concepts because more of it starts to move back into your muscle memory and your uh, cerebellum, which controls the muscle memory, rather than your conscious focusing brain. You generally want, as you progress, for more of that uh, the smaller things to be taken over by your muscle memory. Of course, the gateway to that is to actually be thinking about it consciously first and then gradually sinks back there. Well, like you said, because as you said, like, um, what happens is usually you start seeing like the whole plane as like one thing to get done instead yeah. of each line as each individual sort of like. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I actually see it a lot when we move forwards into the uh, like the rough perspective boxes, because as she was saying, when you're drawing just a line, the, that's like one unit of accomplishment. It's one unit of effort that goes into that. And when you're drawing an ellipse, that's one unit of effort. When you go into drawing a box, people see that initially as one unit as, of effort. So they'll put the same amount of time they might have put into ghosting one line early on into a whole box, which consists of like 12 lines. And so remembering that a line is always just a line, even if it's part of a box, and giving all the extra effort required in a plane or in a box um, is critical. And so you can't just rush through it because you have more to do. You just have to give it more time. We'll tuck these back from it. So, here are our table of ellipses. They're pretty well done again. You'll basically find that for this whole set. Generally, I was watching her do it live uh, while I was at work. Um, and there are a few issues to keep in mind as you move forwards. But the main thing that I look for is, first of all, she's drawing the ellipses very confidently. And so she's maintaining even elliptical shapes. There's not a lot of distortion here. Uh, sometimes you might see a student get a little bit pointy on one end, or if they're just drawing very slowly, it might come out like just... Do you have any extra paper? This drawer thing. Like you get it out of the bag. Just built her a stack of drawers yesterday. Okay, yeah. Alright, thank you. So... While we want a well, you know, a ghosted ellipse that is drawn confidently, uh, someone who isn't ghosting or who isn't drawing through their ellipse or who might be doing both but might be executing very slowly might end up drawing kind of a, a bumpy ellipse that has a lot of deformation. You can see how this part comes out. 
you know, there's a little bit of very subtle wobbling there that I just exaggerated. And so here it's smooth, it's clean, and even the line work, you can tell that it's different. When they draw slowly, it gets very thick and heavy because they're more ink, uh, because of the, uh, the slower stroke, more ink has a chance to get onto the page and they might be pressing a little bit harder. Whereas here it's smooth and clean and there's actually a visible tapering at the beginning and end of the line. So here, we're seeing that the, the ellipses are drawn quite well. Uh, yeah. That's... Okay. And so now the only things that I would keep an eye out for are her tendency to kind of spill out of the space that she's given herself. A lot of these fall outside of that space, and that's generally a matter of ghosting more, uh, putting more time into the preparation and planning beforehand so that you kind of stay within the bounds. Usually when a student needs to focus more on accuracy, there's the risk that they're going to draw slower and then lose their confidence and end up a lot wobblier, even though it falls nicely into the space. We would rather have them come out like this and stick outside of the space and be less accurate, but still be smooth rather than the opposite. So this is the right kind of, uh, I guess, the, the order of priorities, where first you nail getting it evenly shaped and smooth, and then you worry about accuracy. And the accuracy actually improves quite a bit on the second page. There's a little bit of spilling out, but especially when we're dealing with the, uh, like here, the square ones, it's pretty well done. There's still a little bit more over here. Maybe you're getting tired. Oh. They're ellipses. They're not circles. The round ones. They're all round. The, you know what I mean. The, the globy ones. No. Because globes are round. Stop. <laughs> okay. Okay, you going outside. And I put it in the fire. <laughs> I get to burn these, right? I mean, I do tell people that, you know, as soon as you're done, you should treat it like you're just going to throw them into a, one of those hobo cans with the fire in them, <laughs> uh, the oil drums, because, I mean, I do probably need to critique them, but aside from that, don't be precious with them. They're not a work of art. But we can't put these on the wall? I mean... I was gonna, I was gonna decorate our apartment. Those things are falling down again, by the way. Those things that you put up. Yeah, that sticky tack is crap. Yeah. Anyway. A nice way away from that topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, overall, these, again, pretty well done. They're, there's a little bit of deformation where this, for example, is not quite an ellipse. It's tucking in a little bit too much here. So that's mainly what I'm looking for, this one too. Uh, this one's pretty well done. Um, so I look for, first of all, are the ellipses ellipses? These are pretty slightly deformed. It's not even that easy to tell that they're deformed. Some people will really stretch them to kind of occupy the awkward uh, space that they're given. And so we're not seeing it too badly here. The next thing that I look for then is whether or not they're touching all four edges. I've gotten some submissions where the students would literally just draw a circle around the center point and then call it done. It was like miles away from the edges. That was clearly not understanding the purpose of the exercise. Um, but these are pretty close, actually. And considering the limited amount of uh, deformation that I'm seeing, fairly well done. This was a pretty big miss. I believe that when you were streaming, you were yelling at me because I didn't tell you that you'd be using the planes to put ellipses inside of them, even though you've gone through this lesson before. I forgot. It's been a while. Yeah. My okay. life was in flux. I suppose that's what she's saying. But uh, so th that's kind of the trick. Students don't look ahead, and they shouldn't look ahead. So they just focus on drawing whatever planes that are fun and kind of extreme sometimes, and then they fall into my trap where now they have to put ellipses in them, in them and keep them from being deformed. And it makes it a very good exercise, I think. Well, oftentimes, when I have a student who's not quite 
grasping either ellipses or ghosting lines or a combination of these, assigning a few extra pages of this full exercise is a great kind of cover for all of these components in the first two lessons, or first two exercises, first two sections. Take it away. Now, I know that when Ariel drew these, she used a roll of tape as a guide. Do you still have the tape? Yes, I still have the tape. For... Found it. Good. So, pretty good choice. Uh, frankly, I mean, you can try and freehand the curves, but it's going to be a pain in the ass. And what's important here is that she's able to keep the center line fairly center. And since these are consistent, that center doesn't really change. And so it just kind of clears away any of the struggle. So if you have a roll of tape like this, I mean, it's a good thing to use, or really anything with a diameter about this big, because as it gets smaller and smaller, that curve is going to get more and more extreme, and it'll be a little bit harder to use. So if you're using something else that's circular, just make sure that it's pretty large. So here, I think I'm seeing a pretty consistent tilt with some of these ellipses. So like here, I'd say the minor axis that we're supposed to be aligning to this line is more like here. So forget about the fact that it's a little bit positionally off. Actually, no, it's probably not. It's probably closer here, but... The angle is just slightly off from this line, and so you can see it even more over here. And so the thing is, though, I'm seeing a pattern that these are all equally off from the center line, which tells me that Ariel was thinking about keeping them aligned, but just was slightly off in her, like, I guess her um the way that she had the page rotated or the way that her brain was oriented. And so it was consistently off, which is better than having a bunch of ellipses that are kind of erratic at different positions. Usually when I see that, it just tells me that the student wasn't aware of that requirement for the exercise. And so here we can see that it's off again. It might be it's actually kind of tricky to look past this center line and see the actual minor axis. Here is pretty obvious. And yeah, you, pretty much all of these are a little bit off. This one definitely. So that's definitely something to look for. Um, it's pretty common to see that in students. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so just keep an eye on that alignment. And uh, while you're drawing them, you know, Draw a line, and then make sure you're ghosting. Sorry, I'm not using the folder. That's pretty well aligned. Like trying to swing the yeah. arm right there. For anyway, the thank you for making excuses for me. You're welcome. And if we want to add to that, my chair is not high enough for this desk. You're a tiny boy. <laughs> yes. Um, one point to keep in mind when you're drawing on any surface, um, you can't really see at this point, and I don't want to adjust the camera, but your, here's my stack. So you've got a desk here. You are over here. You want your arm, if you're laying your hand flat on the desk, mm -hmm. you want your elbow to be at a 90 degree angle. That's kind of the best for posture because it puts you kind of a little bit over yourself. Right now, my sh elbow is kind of down here because I am teeny tiny. So that kind of impedes your shoulder motion. So make sure that you're sitting kind of straight at, with that at a 90 degree angle. There's nothing to say about these. It's two point perspective, pretty straightforward. Um, all you have to do is make sure that with each line, you know where it's going. Um, everything converges to one of the two vanishing points or remains perfectly perpendicular to this horizon line. Um, there's really nothing else to say about it. I barely even mention them when I'm critiquing people's work because it's just there to show you that 
it's, you know, this is how vanishing points work. I have in the past had a few students who, when they hit the rough perspective work, they didn't know what the hell they were doing because they hadn't been introduced to the concept of a vanishing point in an exercise before. And so that's why I added this very simple exercise. I did have two pages assigned, but when I actually saw Ariel doing them, I said, that's ridiculous. We'll cut it down to one. And all of you can thank her for that because it's updated in the instructions, just one page. Now, I see problems. <laughs> the main problems that I'm seeing are that the lines are not super well executed here. No, I had a hard time. Yeah, you did. So we've got some kind of bowing here. And mm -hmm. some definite, like a little bit of wobbling here too. Was this done on the new desk? No. Because I know that... No, the... I was just having a bad time. Anyway, so, so this basically shows me that more time can be put into the actual ghosting of the lines. So what I was saying previously about the amount of uh, effort that goes into each stroke. When you're doing the ghosted lines exercise, it's just a bunch of lines that are in front of you. Right now, when you see this, you're like, crap, I need to draw like five boxes. And you're not really thinking in terms of, well, that means I'm drawing 60 lines. And so when you start getting into it, it becomes so much more work when you are ghosting through every single line. And so it's very easy to be tempted into not taking as much time with each stroke. Also, I did notice that when you are ghosting your lines, you have a tendency to stop. Uh, when you actually ghost the lines, you kind of lose the rhythm a little bit. And so you'll be like, here's my lines. Ghost, 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 stop. Ghost. I mean, you don't, you don't remove your hand, but you kind of ghost. And then before you execute, you kind of stop and then you do it. What you really need to, tr it is a little bit tricky because you're kind of moving your hand a little bit differently because you have to lower the pen. But you want to try and maintain the rhythm of one, two, three, four, five, so I did actually hesitate slightly beforehand, but you want to kind of eliminate as much of the hesitation as possible. Because when we do, when we do hesitate and pause, we let kind of uh, the, uh, our need to think and control and steer with our eyes get in the way. Uh, a lot of people do complain that, hey, I, can't, I couldn't see the, uh, the end point when I was drawing like that because the end point's here, my hand would be blocking it. Um, it doesn't matter what you can see because you're not drawing with your eyes. You're executing the stroke with the same repeated motion that your muscles have already learned. And so there's no need to actually see where you're going. I, some people will say, you know, just focus on the end point. Don't, uh, don't look at where your pen is, and that's, that's pretty good. Um, I generally let my eyes unfocus a little bit because that keeps me from paying too much attention to, like, consciously where my pen is going. Usually when I, like, pull my arm and stop, it's because almost by default, when I start doing a new line, I start using my elbow right away, and then I'm like, no, that's not right, and then I pull yeah. my arm away, and then I, like... You kind of have to re... Yeah. yeah. But this, yeah. that's usually why that's happening. Okay. Well, that, that is a pretty good reason. It's, it helps to kind of stop, take a step back, and then try it again to rewire the way that you're brain is having your body behave. Um, here's a good one. This line here is not perpendicular to the horizon line. So, yeah, neither is this one. The base, one of the basic tenets of this exercise, and really one-point perspective in general, or any kind of one, two, three-point perspective, is that every single line has a home. It has a place to go. When you're drawing a line, you should never be guessing as to how it's going to behave. There are three options here. You've got your horizontal lines, which run parallel to the horizon line. You've got your vertical lines that run perpendicular to it. So like this one was good, very good, 90 degree angle. And you've got your lines that go off into the distance, which converge towards the vanishing point. There are no other options in this because these boxes are all parallel to the ground plane and to each other. They're not being rotated in any odd way, and they're just 
following a very specific grid. Outside of that grid, it becomes a little bit more organic, and you know that's what the other exercises are for. But right now, we need to make sure that before we start like putting down the points and ghosting through our lines, we need to make sure that we know exactly what we want to achieve with a given stroke. Understand the behavior that you're going after rather than just jumping in and figuring it out as you go. There's no link. Okay. Hi, people. So some of these are better, some of these are kind of crazy. Like this one is obviously, everyone knows that that was a terrible. This one too. I'm not going to nitpick on all the lines, but uh, you can definitely do ghosting better than that. As you've already demonstrated, that's kind of the trick that I pull on students. It's, I'm full of tricks. I show them that they can do it fine and then point out that they're not doing as well as they could. And so it's all about investing all the time that you need to show me the best of your current ability that's i've been using that mantra for years the best of your current ability because you can never do worse than your best unless you're just not trying hard enough because if it's your best it's your best if it's not eh. um there was something else i was gonna say uh but that uh, i'm delightful oh and that i make the best of brownies yes those brownies are delicious. They're slightly salty, and you can't eat more than one at a time because they'll kill you. All right, so the rotated boxes. This one's pretty infamous, and people seem to get a little bit obsessed with this. I've seen so many people post them just as a one-off in the subreddit, and it drives me crazy. Or they do like halfway, and they're like, I don't know what's happening. All right, sometimes people will try real hard and then get lost and confused and then they'll do part of it. Maybe they'll leave out the corners or maybe they'll just do a quadrant like she said. The point of the exercise is not to do it correctly. It's, first of all, to get it done. It doesn't matter if it goes horribly wrong. But the point is, first of all, don't abandon things. See it through to the end because that's how you learn most from it. We're not here to pin something to your fridge. Now, in this exercise, I look for two main things. First of all, I look to see whether or not the student has maintained consistent and narrow gaps between the boxes. And generally, I do see that, especially on these major axes. I see that this one here is getting a little bit narrow. And if that's more of a triangle than a rectangle, so they're not really parallel there. Uh, here, this one's great. This one's pretty good. And so the trick in those gaps, they're not going to be perfectly parallel, but they're going to be pretty damn close. Um, so you're not going to have quite this kind of dramatic convergence between them. And the reason is that, as explained in the lesson, you want to be able to use those neighboring lines as hints. So when you are constructing this line here, you're looking at, I'll use a different color. Don't be those. So you might be looking at this blue one. Is that showing up? And you'll be looking at this green line, which I've just horribly overdrawn when you're drawing this one. You're basically matching up them up to their neighbors because you need them to be almost parallel. When you understand those relationships, it becomes a lot easier to construct those additional lines. And it doesn't feel like you're just guessing. Now, you are going to have to guess some lines because by the time you're drawing this line here or this one, these boxes don't exist, these ones out here. So you do have to guess some of them, but you're, the, the point is that you're limiting, you're eliminating as much unnecessary guesswork as possible. Anyone who's received one of my critiques definitely received that phrase. I, I've been writing so many critiques over the years that I basically have a set of phrases that I just pull out of my pocket constantly. It's just memorization at this point. It looks like it's digivolving into Hey Arnold. 
Do you mean if it, is it getting a football yeah. shape? A little bit, yeah. So the reason for that, that's the second point. So first one was, is she keeping her, ga uh, her gaps between her boxes narrow and consistent? Somewhat, and for the most part. The second one is, is she covering the full range of rotation uh, around on each axis? And she's pretty close. Usually what I look for here is, uh, let's do this one. So you've got this line here going off to some vanishing point. Same with this one. Now when you look at the next box over, you want to see the same pair of lines and then see what they're converging to. The vanishing point, so for these pink ones, it's way the hell over here somewhere. And then for this one, it's getting to be around here. The point is that the vanishing point has, well, is sliding in that direction as the box rotates, and that's correct. That's what we want to see. I would probably have narrowed down this box a little bit, kind of tucked it in while keeping the same convergence, because... Actually, no, sorry. I might have just made the convergence even more dramatic so that the vanishing points were coming out to here, maybe. Just because as you're hitting the kind of the edges around the circle, the rotation is going to get more and more extreme. It's going to get more rapid. Otherwise, you get the impression that the box is starting to get a little bit stretched. And so what we kind of want to look for is... Notice that I'm keeping these lines pretty parallel. This sort of deal. And so you can tell that this has rotated. Relative to its neighbor. Oop, that's remotely clear. Now, obviously proportion for these boxes, it'll get a little bit wacky because there's nothing really to, for us to follow. It's, it's a lot of guesswork. So I don't really worry too much when these things get a little bit too like oblong or if things get a little bit crazy. Usually a student who's done this in their first round, if they were to do it again, they've kind of learned a lot from just you know, you put down a mark and you're kind of committed to it. You might have learned immediately what you did wrong. And so you might apply what you learned there on the next attempt. But generally, I don't want people to grind these. It's not really the point. It's just to understand the relationships of these boxes as they're rotating relative to one another. Now, last of all, there's the organic perspective. I'll turn it this way. So... Here, honestly, I just want students to get this exercise done. There are certain mistakes I always expect to see, and there's certain points that I expect students to eventually pick up on. There are certain mistakes that I want them to make so that the lessons I teach later on become a little bit more clear. First of all, you've got lines that are not converging as they move further off into space. You've got this here and this here. They are actually getting further apart. They're diverging as they move off towards what should be their vanishing point. So that's because this, uh, this face here is oriented towards us. It's moving away from, uh, these lines are kind of gradually moving away from us and they're getting further apart. Same thing here, pretty extreme. So there's still divergence there. Here we've got convergence. But it's not necessarily consistent because these two lines will meet much sooner than this one will uh, meet either of these two. So they're not converging towards the same vanishing point. So those are basically, generally what I say in my critiques is, um, you know, 
you can continue to improve. There's room to improve on getting your uh, line, your sets of parallel lines converge consistently towards their shared vanishing point. So every box is made up of four sets, or sorry, three sets of four parallel lines, and each set has its own vanishing point. As explained in the actual lesson, uh, the box part of the lesson, some of those vanishing points might be at infinity based on the orientation of the box, but we'll not worry about that right now. Most of these are falling into the three concrete vanishing point situation. And so you want to work towards getting them to converge consistently. I don't expect you to be able to do that right now because this is pretty, you know, I didn't really tell you any of that. I just threw you into the deep end of the pool to watch you drown. So we can pull your body out and we can revive you, and you'll have learned a lesson. Always. <laughs> now, another issue that I noticed was line weight. We, again, haven't talked about this. I talk about this in the 250 box challenge. But since it's here, we might as well discuss it. She's got some darker lines on the interior of her box's silhouette. This can have a tendency to break the illusion that all these arbitrary lines come together to create a single cohesive form. So when you have those darker internal lines and lighter external lines, it just feels like they're, they're loosely related, but they're not really solid together. Generally, if you have a little bit of extra line weight along the silhouette of the form, I realize that the camera's up here, so like silhouette of the form, I should just draw it. box real quick and it's not going to be very good. So as you can see here, it's just the silhouette and if we put a little bit of extra weight on the outside and then we've got slightly lighter lines on the inside, it's going to feel more cohesive and more kind of stuck together. It's no longer just an arbitrary set of lines. It's a concrete solid object. Appreciate this at all. <laughs> the other thing that I don't, I specifically don't want students to do on their first round, or rather, I prefer them not to, but eventually I want you to do this for every single box that you draw, is to draw through your forms. That means drawing the edges on the opposite side of the box. So this side is what we're looking at. It's facing us. This is like what we have with x-ray vision. See through to the other corner. And so this corner here is on the other side. This basically gives us, it's what we did in the rotated boxes as well, but it gives us a, an idea of how this box actually sits in three-dimensional space. Here we're just looking at the side facing us. And so we're really only thinking about each box as it exists on the page. One thing that I do like that Ariel did was that when she drew a box that was overlapped by another one, she actually drew that box entirely. Even though it would have technically been hidden here, she drew the whole thing. We're just taking that concept and pushing it even further so we can understand how each individual box sits in space. Once we have that, we can further understand how they relate to one another, especially when we're kind of mushing a bunch of different forms together. Um, is that pretty much it? Oh, well, that, that whole concept of drawing through your boxes, I don't ask students to do it for this exercise because I first want them to kind of get familiar with what it feels like to not use this, this very useful technique. Then when I inevitably push you over to doing the 250 box challenge, which Ariel will be doing, I, uh, that's where I really push the importance of drawing through all your boxes and then afterwards extending your lines like this to see just how they're converging. Uh, yeah, and also if you ever afterwards revisit this exercise, I would hope that you would reflect on that, you know, drawing through your boxes technique and actually apply it here in the future. Not your first time, but every time after that, understand that it's just another tool in your tool belt when you're dealing with three-dimensional space, and that you can apply it not just when I tell you to, but as a technique in 
any applicable situation. Um, so is anyone asking any questions? Because it's pretty much the whole critique. Oh, they're just asking how I'm going to do the box challenge. Oh, yeah. I'm She's sure. going to lose all of her Twitch followers. <laughs> I don't have any Twitch followers. I You've got, got like a hundred and... Whoa, you no, got... that's your trick. Oh. But you have... How many do you have? I don't, I don't know. Um, no, I'm You've got over to... 50. I'm going to just do it. I'm going to do one page every day. One pen, not this pen. Yeah, she's got a box of different pens that she'll be testing out. And what we're currently planning on doing is instead of, like right now, her YouTube channel. Um, by the way, I should mention her uh, Twitch account is... Can you do less than two simultaneously? No. No. <laughs> so that's where you can watch her, and her uh, YouTube channel is the uh, her YouTube username is the same it's thing. Backwards. Are you kidding me? <laughs> okay, let's let's try this. Hold on. To... <laughs> Challenge mode. Because <laughs> we didn't do anything to the webcam before yep. we set up. We just threw. We it. thought it would be great. No, we just didn't think we'd want to bother. I was going to do one page a day. I don't think it taking a long time because I have school starting soon anyways. And um, I also have a bunch of things. I've there we go. Does that, does that read? Ha! Awesome. So that's also her YouTube channel name. Um, and we do upload the, the long, painful uh, recordings of her doing everything. But for the 250 box challenge... She'll be streaming them all in real time because that's the only way you can stream. But what we're thinking of doing is a sort of, each video is going to be a review of the pen that she uses. So we've got a box of different pens. And so she, it'll be like sped up through drawing her boxes because they're just different boxes. But uh, you'll get kind of at the end a little bit of a rundown of, well, this was the pen I used and this is how it felt. And, you know, it died on me halfway through or it... it it keeps going and it's real smooth or it bleeds or it smudges or whatever. So I'm kind of assuming that they're all pretty much going to be pretty similar. But uh, we will find, you know, how much each pen costs and whatever. And in the end, you'll probably find out that our pen is the best. Probably not. I think she actually prefers the, uh, what was the brand of pen that you liked? The Zig? Uh, yeah, Zig. It's weird. But not necessarily for Drawbox, just for drawing in general. Yeah, well, uh, but so far, um, she's done the entire, can, can you pull out the, uh, the Dropbox pen that you're using? She's been doing, well, she did all of lesson one with this single pen. Uh, as you can see here, it's the first one that she used. She pulled it out on July 9th. Yep. Been doing that for this long. Uh, and that just goes to show you. Just pace yourself as you're working through these lessons. You can take as long as you need. We got that too. Oh, oh. They, they were talking about the copy. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got that. That's actually um, a really old one, but I just replaced the ink cartridge, so it's fresh. The nib's fine, though. So, as long as the nibs don't wear out there. Yeah. So, we're done. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, and if Doc's done calling me a mad lad, Oh, and I can't read the name, but you're most welcome. We're happy to do this. Just a lot of consonants, really. This is transition? The transition? I think so. I don't know. I can't really see from it's, here. It, there's not enough vowels. <laughs> Somebody buy this person a vowel. Lost in translation. Oh, there we go. They really do need to be... <laughs> they got an O at the end there. Uh, That's all right. Anyway, so we're pretty much done. Um, hopefully this hasn't run too long. It probably Okay. Well, good night, and I guess I'll see you the next time she finishes a lesson, and you'll see her on Tuesday. I'm making brownies!